Welcome to Product Momentum, a community of thought leaders and learners coming together to celebrate the product people who are shaping our way ahead. Inspired by our most pressing questions and insightful guests, we'll explore the challenges you face and offer practical, hands-on guidance your team can implement today. This is Product Momentum. Here are your hosts, Sean Flaherty and Paul Gable. Well, hello, everyone. Another episode and another amazing co-host that I have joining me today. Uh, Jonathan Kupal is uh, the VP of Security and Infrastructure here at ITX. Uh, I was really happy to have you along for this one, Jonathan. Thanks for joining. Yeah, I'm really glad to have been part of it. I love learning and talking to people about security stuff. I could talk about it all day. Uh, Paul is the the person to talk to. I, I took away so much <laughs> of the conversation. I think my biggest top line, especially from product managers perspective, is the idea of just how human security really is. It's it it can be very technical and get into tools and ops and automation and uh, and really kind of run away into the stratosphere with with how um, intricate these these conversations can get. But but Paul really humanizes it a lot. It's it's humans who build software, humans who use software and humans who break software. Um, what were some of the things that jumped out to you when we were uh, chatting with Paul? Um, I think kind of the, again, it was kind of like how you work with a team. I like, I like that it's such a low bar to do better security, which is something is really better than nothing, right? So anything you can do as a product owner or a product manager to encourage the team to just take a little bit of time, talk about anything that might be a possible threat or a possible security thing, um, you know, can contribute to making a better product. Yeah, couldn't have said it better. I, I think the the conversation here is going to open up some eyes and and hopefully some perspectives into ways that we can bring this into our teams and, and make this practical. So let's get after it. Cool. Hello and welcome to the pod. Today, we have the privilege of being joined by Paul Conahan. Paul's the principal application security consultant at RiverSafe, where he brings a wealth of expertise from both in-house and consulting roles within large global corporations. He spent over three years leading BP's developer security team and now spearheads the application practice at RiverSafe. A seasoned expert in threat modeling, CI, CD, testing, and cloud security, Paul's passionate about instigating change throughout a people-focused approach and agile methodologies. He's experienced as a speaker and recently took part in a debate in the Houses of Parliament as part of the panel of selected experts to address the cyber threat facing the UK. Paul, thanks so much for joining us today. Appreciate you being on the show. You're welcome, Paul. It's great to be here. We've been waiting a while to get this uh, discussion going, so I'm delighted we're uh, we're finally connecting and having this chat. I'm looking forward to it. Absolutely. To get awesome. things started, I'm going to toss it right over to to my co-host Jonathan to get us going with some some ideas to lay the land. Yeah, hey, uh, Paul asked me to sit in on this one. I'm the security guy here at ITX, and I was really excited to have another security guy to talk on the product development side of the the business. One of the big things that that is in constant discussion is this idea of shifting left or shifting security left. And for those of our listeners who might not be aware of that term, the idea is to move some of those non-functional requirements that get tested in the quality end of or the quality assurance end of the spectrum back into the intentional design end of the of the process. And I'm I'd love to hear from you a little bit about your kind of feeling about the shift less concept and maybe how it plays into a lot of common misconceptions that we see in, in the product design. Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, shift left has been something that I've focused with clients six, seven years now. So, you know, I think it's one of these things where, you know, we, we often think about shift left being like, you know, just about security scanning. So like when we've actually written some code, you know, we want to shift left and test that code uh, as far left as possible, left to right being the, you know, there's the sort of SDLC, but actually you can go further left than that, right? And that's one of the topics that I'm really passionate about, which is threat modeling. Um, mm-hmm. Typically, threat, threat modeling is, you know, something that's conducted by security folks like you and I in cyber organizations. And uh, it's typically, you, you, you know, it's quite hard, quite involved to go and produce threat models for things that you don't understand, right? So it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. And uh, what I advocate for is actually teaching the, the, the app teams, the product teams, and do this themselves. And, you know, that, that I think is beautiful in a number of ways. One is it helps us address the scale challenge. There's just not enough people in cyber to actually effectively secure all the applications and products that are out there. 
but also it, it lets us get into the habit of having everyday conversations about security, which is fundamentally you know, the thing that's going to help close the gap. There's still yeah. a lot of developers out there, software engineers out there, product folks out there who don't have this kind of baseline knowledge of what it means to deliver, deliver a secure product. And you know, the Houses of Parliament event, uh, I was at another one last night, actually, and you know, this topic came up and it's about trust, really, right? You know, so the eventual outcome of all the products that we create is we want consumers to use them, right? Now, they're only going to do that if they believe that it's secure. And I would attest right now to the fact that it's only going to be secure if we stop thinking about security as some sort of checkpoint and integrate it into our daily work. So, you know, for us, what we advocate for is threat modeling within sprints and, you know, and, and the increments that the teams use anyway. And just asking some basic questions about, you, you, you know, what interfaces have we got here? Have we had a discussion about, you know, is it secure? Do we need to think about controls? What threats exist, et cetera? Yeah, how do you get development teams enrolled in the idea of shift left or of designing security, especially considering their practices are are already kind of ground in, so to speak? You know, they have yeah, habits but, of how they do their development work and how they write stories. And are there any tricks or techniques that you use to get people enrolled in opening themselves up to more of a bigger picture? Yeah, it's all psychological. So like, a lot of this stuff sucks. You know, I'm a bit of an outlier when I go to industry things because I'm talking about these really soft, subtle things. But, you know, if, uh, if I'm rolling out a program where we want to change developer behavior, we first need to accept that that is a behavior change and think about how humans actually think and act. So some of the things that I do, I've, you know, it's very, very subtle. But I want to drive into the craftsmanship of software development, right? You know, Nobody comes to work thinking, hey, I want to make an insecure app. Nobody comes to work saying, I want to create lots of problems down the line, or I want to spend six months creating this beautiful thing for some guy to come and wreck it down the, down the line. Like, no, no one wants that. But equally, they don't want people walking around the big lists going, hey, yo, you've got lots of vulnerabilities, fix them now. So it, for me, it's all about taking a human-centric approach. Now, we have to accept that these teams have processes they already use. You've touched on it yourself, right? So the first thing I would say is, from a cyber point of view, unless you've got that attitude that actually the earliest anything's going to happen is two weeks from today, i.e. in the very next increment, uh, then you're already losing, right? There's nothing about what we do from a cyber or app sec point of view that's, you know, more important than the value these applications and, and products bring to the organizations. So we have to respect the processes and also, we need to use subtle language and words to help these developers, engineers, and product folks understand that we care about helping them. We're not here to be a barrier. And, you know, we actually understand what their craft is and how it works. You know, the subtle thing I always start my conversations with, for, with every team. Now, they don't realize that this is very templated. It seems natural when I say it, but it's pretty much hundreds of teams over thousands of apps. So, hey, my name's Paul, you know, from the cyber team, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I know nothing about your app. So before we get any further, can you just take five, ten minutes, talk to me a little bit about your app, who the users are, and what value it brings to the organization. And that seems like a really subtle thing, but straight away, emotionally, they're like, oh, this guy cares. And that's important, right? You need to build that rapport and social collateral with people so they want to do it, right? You know, the reason... Developers have got bad rep, not engaged with cyber. Cyber are terrible at collaborating, typically. That's what I've seen, right? They like, responded well to that method of uh, enticement. And um, I feel that flattery gets you a long way. Um, so, you know, engage with them on a human level first, build that rapport. And I've found that, you know, they often want to do the right thing. You've just got to make it easy enough. To do, which is the second part of, of the dynamic beyond building that sol solid sort of first real human connection with them. You also mm -hmm. need to make sure what you're asking them to do is kind of feasible, right? They have to be able to do things in days and weeks, probably days. You know, so it needs to be small. They don't want to be using extra tools. Ideally, you want to meet them where they're already at. So, like, no one wants you to give them a new portal <laughs> of any description. Far less two, three, four portals for security tools, right? They've already got 
16, 17 different tools within the development ecosystem. Um, so what we, so what we specialize at Riversafe is like, you know, keep the tools that you've got. Let us worry about the security side and we'll give you things in there that you should pay attention to. You know, we're helping you to see the, the, the signal from the noise. Yeah, that's an excellent segue into a, a, a topic that I wanted to pick your brain out for just a second. The idea of shifting left, I think, can go even further to when, you know, b beyond development and product design specs into really a user centric design model and, and user centric design, meaning sort of the the end to end experience, not just the look and feel and, and components and buttons and fonts, but the actual the experience of the journey through an app in a technical ecosystem. So in thinking about this aspect of designing secure products, what are some examples even further out than sort of the, you know, developers don't come to work wanting to build an insecure platform. How can designers take a page from that same playbook and think about other examples where keeping that user as the center of good product design and architecture can start at the, at that user centered design phase of thinking about really from the foundation up of, of an app. I'll use an example that takes us even away from software. So I think it's quite easy to talk about, you know, so if you've got an electric vehicle and you want to install a charge post at your home, I think it goes without saying that you don't want your neighbor to take your, take your electricity and charge their car, right? You know, so this is a very obvious user requirement that you might find if you're going out and doing research with users about, hey, you know, we want to put a charge post in your home. What are your concerns? And I mean, that's a slightly different technique to the ones that we might typically use in terms of, you know, you could draw the charge post ecosystem and do stride or something like that to enumerate potential threats. But I bet you, if you were to do user research, people would say things like that. But what makes you reluctant to, to install a charge post, right? In the black, you know, uh, there's someone at the event yesterday said that they're, they're a bit dubious about having a smart fridge. Because like, you know, all this connectivity, all this IoT connectivity, you know, comes in as an attack vector and, you know, the face actors can disrupt your life or, you, you know, impact your life by, by leveraging these connected devices. I, I can, I can actually attest to the fact that the general public are thinking about this stuff now. And some of them are maybe overly worried about it because the potential is huge for, for harm to happen. But, you, you know, it's, it's definitely a hot topic here in the UK. Um, people are thinking about all this stuff. I think the geopolitical situation across the world makes that uh, even more of a pointed issue for everyone where organized crime groups and state actors are out on the rampage to get money and to cause harm. Yeah, honestly, anybody who's gone through a nasty divorce can tell probably stories about poor security on <laughs> user-connected devices. Let alone foreign threat actors and people with that kind of animosity. I wanted to touch on something you'd mentioned a couple of times, which is threat modeling. The tooling of threat modeling includes a bunch of kind of ways of thinking about stuff. Like you mentioned stride. Sometimes yeah. we think about like, what does a threat actor look like or identifying threat actors? What's some of the tooling in, in your threat modeling process that you teach? your development teams that you work with that you find them or that they find to be more effective? Oh, I'm know? not sure if everyone's going to like this answer, but actually <laughs> the, 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 the tool is very much a secondary issue to me. So the only tool that you need is a pen and a piece of paper and people willing to talk, right? Mm -hmm. And that's where I always start. It's a point of maturity, right? Especially when we think about enterprise, right? You know, where you've got thousands of you know, software engineers and product folks in large organizations. The first challenge, I think, is actually not to get caught up in which tool best. And this applies to all app set tools, not just threat modeling, right? The, the, the differentiation between one tool and another is very subtle often. And the question of whether it's the right tool for that organization or not has many different perspectives that you have to consider. So there isn't like a, a right or a wrong answer. Sure, sure. You know, there are better tools that are you know, top right, Gartner, Fortune, and all this sort of thing. But actually, the tool isn't going to save you. Right. Uh, what's going to save you is the people and process aspect of it. And that's what we spend a huge amount of time focusing on. So the first thing you've got to try and break down the barrier on when it comes to threat modeling isn't which tool you're going to use. It's like, how can we actually get these teams to have this conversation with no, like a tool just complicates it. Right. The only tool that you need is the ability to draw circles and lines and rectangles, yeah. i.e. a data flow diagram. And like something that's going to remind you what the strive categories are. And then you can go, 
right? And you know, I remember when we've we've all this stuff out across the globe, and you know, I remember speaking to some guys, and they were like, "This was really cool because we were having water cooler moments after the training, where we were like, you know, sipping water, talking about the potential threats on a new interface world building." And I, like, my heart just uh, warmed to hear those words because that was exactly what we were intending for. And, you know, when yeah. you get into uh, the point where the conversations are natural and happening frequently, and then you want to say, well, actually, these drawings are constraining us because we want to be able to reuse models or interrogate and query models. And that stage, I think that's where tools come in. And, you know, a lot of the tools are much of a muchness. Again, you know, the, the things that yeah. might, I might help a client to, to choose a tool over would be far more, more sort of organizationally specific you know, tool A versus tool B might be because tool A has got a better integration with some of the other ecosystem that they've got. Hey, product people, some exciting news to share about product momentum. We're teaming up this year with Mike Belsito and Paul McAvinci and all our good friends at Product Collective, beginning in the Big Apple on April 18th. We'll be recording live at the New York Product Conference at the Time Center with conversations already booked with the great April Dunford, Holly Hester Riley, and many more. In fact, the product conference is only the first of three product collective industry events where we'll be recording with their amazing keynote speakers. We'll also be in Dublin for Industry Europe in mid-June and then in Cleveland for Industry Global in late September. To stay in the loop with these events and more, head to itx.com and sign up for our newsletter. And now let's get back to the show. Yeah, now let me ask a, a little bit more strategically about threat modeling too. Uh, if you look at a lot of the materials that's built around threat modeling, especially like a lot of the foundational stuff that like Showstack wrote, it really looks like it's the process is tuned for people who are doing stuff that looks a lot more a waterfall. How do you trans like that translate that into agile where you may have product design occurring well into the the design cycle well after you've originally um done your first model or or written your first data flow diagram or whatever like how do you translate it down into like something that's constantly changing yeah that, i mean that is a great question the technique that that, that we've used to, to handle that is to black box stuff that's historic and model on new new bits right I mean, there is no silver bullet here the threat model for an entire application in the modern day is a complex, large thing. But the truth, mm -hmm. as with anything agile, is you can only get there incrementally, right? So you have to, you know, focus on the work that's going on now, I think is probably what I would encourage. Yeah, you've got your stuff that's already been built, sure. But the, the, the point is to try and change the practice of new things and change your way of working so that you don't get into that. And eventually, over time, you'll build up a larger model that mm -hmm. represents every flow in the system. But we, we used to, you know, well, we still do it actually when, when we're taking teams through this, as we say, pick three use cases. And we actually bring some security experts alongside the development team and the product team to build their first data flow diagram and threat model on three of our use cases. So it might be like logging in, you know, let's think about, I don't know, a crypto wallet, for example, that, you know, want to buy some Ethereum, you know, or booking a holiday, I want to book a holiday, you know, some something fairly basic that touches components across the architecture. Mm -hmm. And then we're having powerful discussions about, about those bits. But just like the team is delivering in small increments, you should threat model in small increments as well. You know, and I think that's something that, you know, you can also sort of add this to your checklist, if you like, per sprint to look at, well, did we threat model in this sprint? Do we anticipate any significant interface changes? Not every change needs a, needs a threat model update or a threat sure. model at all. But, you know, you should have enough skill within your team to identify, hang on, are we going to cross a trust boundary here? Is there a reason for us to have this discussion? And, you know, in, invariably all applications touch other applications. And sometimes those applications are outside the org. Sometimes they're inside the org. But even if they are inside the org, you know, that interface between two teams is a bit where we want to say, let's stop and have a chat. And even if it's one line between two components on one use case, you can still have a really powerful discussion about what do we anticipate the threats might be here. And the techniques that I would always use to not get bogged down keep it quick is the first thing you're trying to do is brainstorm the threats, right? Assess the controls against the threats afterwards, but 
take the power of collaboration in the room to say what what are all the possible things that could go wrong here. As long as you've got someone there to seed some her mindset, the makers, i.e. the people who are creating this stuff, <laughs> like they're, they're in a far better position to talk about you know, what could possibly go wrong. I mean, we're just there really to help them think broadly about things that they might not naturally do. But yeah, I think, you know, to summarize, breaking down the threat model into smaller pieces, and if you've got a big legacy piece, put it in a black box and just say, well, we're not modeling this just now, we're only modeling the bit we've added, is, is a technique that you can use to, to get it more incremental and, and sort of agile in terms of the depth. Involved. And then obviously asking these questions when you're doing sprint planning, for example, hey, does this feature team, uh, I'm sure you might need enablement and training to, to get to the point where you do that, but you should be able to plan that work in with the team. And for me, I mean, we train teams how to do this in three, three hour sessions conducted over the course of a week. That's totally doable inside Agile, right? So we can train them how to do it from zero. In a, in a sprint, so why can't they maintain the actual practice inside sprints? There's no reason why they can't. So, yeah, that's what I would say. I think that the um, reluctance, if you like, is that they over-engineer in their head what's necessary for it to be valuable. The truth is, if you can identify one interface, one use case, and one threat, it's been useful. You know, uh, I'm not saying it's uh, job done. It needs to be continuously part of our everyday work and part of our every yeah, something sprint. is better than nothing. Oh, for sure, for sure. You know uh, exactly. And this is the reality. The reality is most teams aren't having these conversations at all at the moment, and uh, that's a bit of an issue. My next question is a bit of a two-parter, and you and you can answer it in whatever order feels right. First, it's sort of zooming out. I'm curious, just as you're called in to speak, uh, both in governmental and, and in in industry, and and certainly your client spaces. What's been changing in the enterprise that's different now, you know, over the past couple of decades? What, what feels different in 2024? And then specifically kind of zooming back in from that question, most of the folks listening to this episode have product manager or product owner in their title in some way, shape or form. Taking that, that context of how things are changing and where we're at in the current landscape, what do you wish more product managers knew about security going into their conversations with oh, their team. Yeah, sure. I'll go backwards on that one. Uh, sure. I think the first one's got a much more generic answer, but, uh, yeah. you know, in terms of product managers, product owners, you know, w one essential technique, you know, if I could appeal to all product managers out there, would be to speak with your agile coach or scrum master, whoever's mm -hmm. helping you on that delivery side, and, you, you know, make sure that you accept there has to be capacity allocation for tech debt, right? Now, a lot of teams don't do this. They complain, you know, forever about, oh, we need to deliver feature value, feature value, feature value. The reality is, you know, when we find defects in software, that's tech debt, right? And all tech debt in one form or another is potentially a security concern. So if I could only ask for one thing, it would be like, give us 20% of your capacity on every sprint protect that, commit to it, and, and, and have one backlog. Prioritize all your features and all your bugs and tech debt in one backlog, but fill the capacity allocation. Now, for some teams, they may be like, you know, okay, we need to put more focus on this, we'll go 30%, 40%. Other teams might be saying, actually, I can't afford that, I need to get more value out, it needs to be 10%. I would say any less than 10%, you're probably just pretending and paying lip service to it. But ideally, if you could say 20% that's two days of sprint, this should be doable, right? And actually, that will have compound impact over time that will address these problems. And, you know, if we can get people in cyber to also accept those sorts of timescales and the fact that the security issue backlog is no, no more important than the feature value backlog and both has to be addressed continuously over each increment, then we'll win them, frankly. And that's what I would ask for. I think the, the, the biggest change, I mean, if we want to say a couple of decades, I think you know, the, the adoption of Agile is certainly something which is very different to, to when I started on my career. But thinking about what's the same, right? The same thing for me is it's all about people, right? You know, people get caught up in tools, they get caught up in tech, 
And, you know, they think that everyone that works in tech needs to be a software engineer and they're on the command line and they're spinning up servers, and which is not true. I, I, I believe that we still uh, lack diversity uh, in the industry, cyber probably more acutely than, than tech in general. Uh, a lot of that has to do with misconceptions, right? So, you know, I, I believe in diversity of thought wholeheartedly. And, um, you know, uh, I think we're making progress, but there's way more to do. You know, the, the insatiable thirst for people with tech talent has never relented in the 20 odd careers that I've been working. I don't see it relenting anytime soon. And yeah, I think if we can encourage more people from more diverse backgrounds to join the party, you know, it's just so integrated into our daily lives that, you know, you don't want to leave any innovation on the table by having a closed mindset. You want to have an open mindset. And as long as you figure out the techniques to, to do those things well, I promise you good things will happen, right? You know, I built many high performing teams before I, I was in cyber. You know, I was a product manager myself, you know, so I've done this stuff and I, I find nothing more satisfying truly than, you know, starting that journey with a team. Nobody knows each other and you go through that process. And then before long, you're like, whoa, whoa we're, we're kicking with gas here. This is really taking off. It, it, fe- it fuels my soul, frankly, to, to go through those things. And actually, it is all about people. People use software, people make software, and people break software. So actually, it's all about people and nothing to do with tech or tools. And think of a better way to end a conversation like this. Just in closing, I'd love to to turn it over to you to point our, our listeners anywhere you think would be beneficial. Your work at RiverSafe, any of your writings, where can folks find you and more information on this that you'd think would be inspirational to them? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I'm on LinkedIn, I guess, is probably where my, my I guess, sort of professional um, uh, presence is. We're, you know, often doing press related stuff on there. And, you know, if anyone wants to talk, I, I, I'm a real human guy. So, you know, if people want to drop me a message on LinkedIn, I'd be delighted to hear from them. Um, we can arrange a call. They can head over to riversafe.co.uk and check out, you know, what we do at Riversafe. Um, we work with household names. I'm sure people will recognize the, the sort of large enterprises that we work with over there. And yeah, you know, for, for me, it's all about trying to collaborate as an industry and, and move the conversation forward and get to greater levels of sophistication. So if anyone wants to chat about that, uh, I can chat chat forever. Well, it's been a pleasure chatting with you today, Paul. I, I really appreciated the time no that you've taken. Your, your insights have really kind of taken us up to uh, Mount Everest and, and back into the valley and made it all practical. So I really appreciate your perspective. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. Well, that's it for today. In line with our goals of transparency and listening, we really want to hear from you. Sean and I are committed to reading every piece of feedback that we get, so please leave a comment or a rating wherever you're listening to this podcast. Not only does it help us continue to improve, but it also helps the show climb up the rankings so that we can help other listeners move, touch, and inspire the world just like you're doing. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next episode. Mm -hmm.